Welcome to the Spectrum Lounge podcast, where we discuss creatives of color disrupting the game in TV, film, and pop culture. I am your host, Rebecca Theodore Vachon, and on this episode, we chat with actor Jake Choi, star of the ABC hit comedy series, Single Parents. Hi, Jake. What's up, Rebecca? <laughs> this, yeah. is a long, this is a long time coming. <laughs> Thanks. It really is, though. Oh my gosh! Well, you know the thing is, I, like, my plan was like, I really wanna, I wanted to do it like live in studio with you, but of course, this whole pandemic is just pretty, pretty fucked up. Twenty twenty, so that's just a pipe dream. So no, <laughs> man, twenty twenty, throw it, throw it away. Woo! Just, All I'm, of it. <laughs> I know. Let's go to twenty twenty one. Let's fast forward. <laughs> <laughs> so, how are you holding up over in LA? How's how's the quarantine going over there? You know, um, I'm just staying safe, um, mm. staying sane. Uh, you know, um, like I'm, 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 I'm a homebody. I'm kind of antisocial to begin with. Um, so at first it was okay, but like now it's like God. Like I would love to just go to a cafe or go to the beach or something. You know, so right. just keeping occupied, um, uh, trying to develop uh, projects as much as I can right now. And, Mm-hmm. You know, uh, just catching up on reading. Um, uh, I got back into um, um, reading um, plays because uh, I was slacking on that front. And oh. yeah, me and my friends, me and some other actor friends, we have a play reading thing on sun every Sunday. We do like a Zoom play reading of a new play, um, and uh, it's it's kind of dope, you know. Like um, it 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 sort of builds it builds morale. It kind of uh, helps us get stay creative mm-hmm. and um i've just been catching up on um naruto and you know other animes um avatar last airbender i i re- started re-watching that because it's been like 15 years oh wow it's so I good need, i need to watch that i have not i know i'm about somebody about to pull my nerd cred i have not watched <laughs> <laughs> i have not watched the last avatar i'm terrible i know i'm gonna get to it i promise yo rebecca get to it. don't let yeah. the- don't let the blurs uh, hear this podcast. <laughs> They're gonna come for me. <laughs> They're gonna come for you. No, um, yo, like, um, I think they if you don't have like um access to it right now, I think Netflix is going to drop the um the actual animated series in May. Oh no, of in this month. This month, I think like middle of this month, um, which is really smart because they're you know they're doing the live action. Um what? The remake. They are? Oh Netflix- wow. Yo, Netflix and the and the original creators of the uh, animated series, I think they're gonna work together to to bring the animated live. I mean, the live uh, uh, action remake. Wow! And, and I think they were like, "Yo, we're like we're not. It's not gonna be like the movie. The movie was uh, abominable. Like it was yeah. like it was a uh, it was terrible. And I mean, don't quote me, but like I think they're like they kind of like hinted like, yeah, we don't want to go that route because it was mm-hmm. horrible." But, um, so basically, so basically, what you're saying is Scarlett Johansson should not be expecting a call. Oh, <laughs> I, oh. <laughs> I'm just saying because it was it was totally whitewashed. That movie was just hell movie. yeah. Oh it my was. god! All the POC were like um, side characters or like the antagonist. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it was it was horrible. It was really horrible. Like yeah, so Scar Jo and the Stone, they can you know put the script Take down. Yeah, um, was wasn't Dave Patel in that live yeah, action, or am I thinking something? Dev oh. Patel played Zuko, um, uh, Prince Zuko, and Dev Patel is talented, but I think they underwrote his mm-hmm. character was underwritten, um, like uh, you know, like Lord Ozai wasn't like what I was like expecting, you know, like it was just it was a mess, you know, um, yeah. But so I think the series and you should do it as a series. It can't be a movie. Like it has to be a series because I agree. Yeah. There's just so much to mine. There's so much. There's so much, you know, like there. Um, but yeah, I've been I've been rewatching that. I'm like almost done with season two and it just hits differently when you're older. You know, when, you know, like uh, you have uh, some kind of like like some experience in life and like just like a lot of things like just relate more to you, you know, um. And so I've just been rewatching that. Yeah, Naruto, reading a lot. Um, Didn't you get a tattoo from one of those from Naruto? I did. I got I got two little small shotting guns on my thighs. What? Wait, did it hurt? How long did it take? 
you know what it mm-hmm. it, it, it took maybe like uh combined um all together it was like maybe like 50 minutes like uh, maybe like a little less than an hour um mm-hmm. it didn't really hurt too much because um uh, half of it were like points it was like point work yes then and then like the rest of it was like just like lines but it, it didn't really hurt it it, it it stung because um the thighs are a sensitive area yes. for me at least so yeah. Um, it just like, you know, there were some times where like it stung, but it, it wasn't like nearly pain as painful as like my chest tattoo. Like that shit, the the Ooh. my butt keeper. Yes. Oh boy, that shit <laughs> was painful. Oh my gosh. Wow. That is that is so cool. Um, so yes, yeah, so let's talk about single parents. So you're mm-hmm. you're two seasons in. It's it's a yeah. comedy series on, on yeah. ABC. And um I had a chance to binge watch the first season last year and it's and I'm I'm currently catching up on the second season. That yeah. show is hell that show is hella funny. It's um, funny. Yeah. So tell us about the, your character and just sort of like the story arc we can we've been expect we that we've been witnessing the last couple of years with Miggy. Yeah um you know Miggy is um he's such a likable character you know maybe he wears his heart on his sleeve um he has a very strong moral compass you know he's he's naive and clueless but doesn't realize it he thinks he's like the smartest person in the room he thinks he his he, he always has ideas and he always thinks his ideas are like the best ideas in the world and um I think that confidence in himself, despite his lack of like awareness and um, intelligence is what makes him so charming. You know, he, he, his intentions are always like pure and um, it's, it's fun in season two when you see his snarky side, when he gets a little, um, a little petty, a little shady, when he throws some shade, like it's, it's really fun, funny to see that because now you're seeing his like other, like he's, you're seeing dimensions to him right um but but at his, at, at his core his essence is is a very warm-hearted um uh loving person um and you know he's like this young dad uh who's like a sneakerhead you know he he he, he uh is really hip and he's always like you know um in this in the hype beast scene and he he all of a sudden has a has a baby and you know his life as like a young like 20 21 year old like a young adult has you know has been has been turned upside down um mm-hmm. but you know like it, his life has been changed but it's like it but it's it's for the positive you know um he's now forced to grow up and become a father and you know uh, uh, um uh sort of learn to be mature and to take care of another human being. And um, it's, it's beautiful to see like his growth through mm-hmm. two seasons, you know, um, you know, there's, there are a couple of points where he, I think, you know, he's thinking of giving up and there, are, you know, sometimes it's pretty funny where, you know, he's, I, I'm pretty sure he's thinking of like, like, like throwing his baby, like in the garbage, you know, like, like there's one point where he's like looking at his baby, like, <laughs> Can I just leave this baby on top of someone's car? But he doesn't do it. He doesn't right. do it. You know, like, because yeah. that would be horrible. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and it's very illegal. Um, so he, you know, it. You see, like little baby steps that he's taking towards becoming a, you know, responsible father and an adult, and sort of, um, stepping into his own, uh, adulthood. It, it, right. It's a, in a way, you know. Yeah, and it's it's such a great ensemble cast. You have like Taryn Killam, uh, Leighton Meester, Kimry Lewis, Brad yeah. Garrett. Yeah. And the thing with Lisa, like I knew her from Gossip Girl. I had no, I had no idea that she was so funny. I had no idea you were so funny. I was like, we've been friends for three years, and I was like, I mean, you're naturally funny, as like Jake Choi is naturally funny, but like to actually see you like on a comedy series as yeah. Mickey. It's just like wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yo, like Layton is hilarious. Um, uh-huh. like, like dude, she, she'll she has these little facial tics that she does mm-hmm. that is like so unique to her, but it works so well. Like she does this thing where she lifts her like when she lifts a, a, a side of her lip, like Elvis up. Um, yeah. 
and then there's the, like a thing where like she'll do with like her eyes sometimes and it's hilarious um mm. yeah you know i never thought that the first show that i would get on as a regular would be a comedy I, like i i never thought that i thought at most maybe like a dramedy or a dark comedy maybe on like a barry kind of thing mm-hmm. or like uh, orange is a new black kind of like tone but like i never thought it'd be like a prime time like you know half hour sitcom right so how did how did you come across the role i just you know um my rep sent me an email and they were like hey it, it, this was like in the in the throes of pilot season yeah and um they were like, you have an audition for this pilot. It's for ABC. Uh, I had just done the ABC showcase like a few mm-hmm. months before, prior. And um, they were like, yo, you have this audition. Um, it's one of our favorite pilots of the whole like season out of all the networks. You know, like, uh, so this this should be good for you. And this is, and it's, and they are both saying it's like their favorite role, their favorite character. So mm-hmm. I read the email and I read the breakdown and I was like, oh, this sounds interesting. And so I read the script and I was like, yeah, this is a really good script. And this character is like, like the best character in the world. He's so likable, you know, like, um, and he's so funny. Uh, so I went to the audition um, and, you know, I wasn't surprised to see like there were no Asian actors auditioning, but I was disappointed. I was disappointed that they weren't reading, you know, too many Asian actors. Um oh. So but, Mickey wasn't so Mickey wasn't originally written as an Asian American character. No, I think he was written as like open ethnicity. Oh, but, okay. Yeah, he was written as open ethnicity. Uh, most of the actors that were there were black, Latino, and white. Mm-hmm. There were there were a couple of white actors there, and then there was me, and um, but I know like I think one other Asian actor friend of mine read for the role, uh, um, Yoshi. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, wait, was it Yoshi or Peter? Sudarso. One of the Sudarso oh, yes! brothers. I know the Sudarso brothers. Yeah, one of the yes. Sudarso brothers read for it, which is cool. You know, it's like, okay, uh-huh. like, yeah, like you shouldn't read only like one Asian actor for this role. It's written on open ethnicity. But yeah, yeah. Um, so I went in, auditioned, uh Seth Yankowitz, who was a casting director um for our pilot, like and um half of season one. I love mm-hmm. him to death. Like he, yeah, he was like, Yeah, that was good, let's do it again. Um, let's try it another way. We did it and then left. Uh, an hour later, I got an email. They're like, yo, he wants to bring you in for the producer's callback. So mm-hmm. a few days later, I went to the producer's callback. Um, and it was um, Jason Weiner who directed the pilot. You know, Liz Merriweather and J.J. Philbin, who are our showrunners and creators. Um, and uh, Catherine Pope, who was our producer. And then Seth was there. And so I read for them. Um, you know, and they laughed a little bit. Uh, and then they were like, cool. Like, thanks for coming in. And then, And I was like, cool, thanks. And then so like when I left the room, I was like, all right, I guess like that's as far as I go, you know, like they didn't seem. (laughs) And then um, uh, um, the next day, you know, my manager says, yo, you're testing for the studio. Um, Wow. Oh, shit. So the producers, you know, basically when you test test for the studio, that means the producers are are if they could cast you, they would cast you, you know, Mm -hmm. like they'd like they're happy with you Um, and you and maybe like two other options, you know, but it has to come down to like one person in the studio and the network that's who really gets gets the last say so you know basically the studio test was the producer session again but at fox this time um not at the casting office so we were in there for like an hour you know it was like a work session just kind of like you know um trying to get the best take for each scene and there mm-hmm. were like scenes so we did that for an hour they sent it off the studio approved um two out of three actors so me and some other dude got approved and then the network saw it and um, they were like, yo, we got notes like for both of you. So uh, you need to go back to Fox with the producers and do the scenes again with the notes, implement the notes that we have as ABC. So wow. I did that again. I went to back, back back to Fox again and then did that with the producers and then and then they sent it in. And I think like a day, like the, like two days later. Or yeah, I think it wasn't the next day. I think two days later, they were like, "Yeah, you, 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 you got the pilot. You got second wow. parents." Yeah, and and you know, I cried. I was, I was, I, matter matter of fact, I was on the public bus. I was on public transport coming back from another audition, and you know, like felt like, you know, I was, I was kind of like frustrated um, with the audition, mm-hmm. and, like just the things that happened in the in the room, you know, like um, uh, with the casting director and. Uh, 
I was like, you know, feeling a little whatever. And then I got the news. Yeah. And I just like broke down the bus right there. You know? Oh, what, was that? In, that was in L.A., right? Mm hmm. Oh, great. that was in L.A. That was like right, right, right in front of my apartment. Wow. That is amazing. That yeah. is amazing. Yeah. yeah. And here I'm we so are. I know. Like, I'm so happy for you. Like, I love that show. I, have, has there been any word on, as far as like renewal for season three? Because I know you guys are like, what, 13 episodes in, 14 episodes? Uh, we, um, for, oh, you mean um, for, for season two? Right yeah. Now? For season two. Mm -hmm. You know what? No, um, next week is our finale. Wow. That was quick. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, yeah. last night we had a two episode night. Mm -hmm. Um. And next week is the finale, yo. Like, it's crazy. So we're, like, done with season two in terms of airing the episodes. Um, right. Yo, you know, we're supposed to find out, like, if if there was no COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, we would know by, like, May, like, 14, 15. Like, we would know. Matter of fact, we would know by, like, May 12, 13 or something like that. Um, right. But you know, because of the pandemic, we don't know. Like, we don't know if they're going to announce it on time. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I hope we get renewed. I think we deserve it. We should. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. That'd be great. You know, and I think, and, and I really want a third season because I feel like, uh, you know, with in, in regards to Miggy, I think he got some development, but he got the least amount of development out of, all the the adult parents so i feel like in season three like he he will most likely like get a huge arc or arcs you know like within the season um and i think you know hopefully like zara gets introduced you know in season three um his baby mama so oh we haven't met the baby mama yet okay. no we haven't like seen her yet okay okay yeah so that would be nice, you know, to get a third season and like really like see him, you know, um, get fleshed out like really, really well, you know. Right. Well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm rooting for an Asian American actress for the baby mama. Not that I have anything against, you know, interracial relationships, but it would be nice. It would be nice, nice to oh, see yeah. a, a young Asian American couple trying to figure out like this non traditional style of parenting. I think that would be cool. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, uh, there's no question about it. Zara, I mean, the baby looks like he's Asian, like non-mixed Asian, you know? Like, it wouldn't make sense for Zara to be not Asian, you know? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, that would be dope just to have, because we don't have, like, a young, like, young, hip, like, um, beautiful Asian-American couple on any TV shows, on any movie, in any movies right now, like, um, who are the leads like yeah, if you, think, if you think about it if you yeah. think about it mm -hmm. i don't think you can name one on the tv side mm, i mean except i mean that's not american that's like kim's convenience but even those couples are interracial yeah because simu Lu's lee simu Lu's character is with in an interracial relationship exactly the sister she is kind of like in this love triangle where the boyfriend was south asian um her ex was like a he's a doctor and then she's kind of dating another guy i think he's white i could be wrong i'll have to i have to go back um, okay, and chat. Okay. but yeah yeah but that even then that's ca canadian television still right. valid but not right. yeah but yeah, as far yeah. as coming out of hollywood mm -mm, no yeah coming out of hollywood like coming out like yo like kim's convenient like if if there's anyone that's gonna do that it would be kim's convenience like that'd be that's because you know like they, they they don't have the they don't need to like um appease you know like uh certain people like that so mm -hmm. it's, it's great of Kim, kim's convenience to do that but like out of hollywood tv and film <clears throat> right you can't <laughs> name one. you can't name ah! one. all we got was crazy we got crazy rich asians that's what's been holding us down <laughs> for the last couple of years. it was just like oh my god to like actually see like asian couples like in love yeah. and like you know, it's just at least out of the Hollywood system, it's it's so rare. That's unfortunate, but yeah, I, yeah. I'm telling you, and and Crazy Rich Asians, you know, like like they're uh, that couple, um, uh, because yeah, Constance's character was American, Henry Golden's mm -hmm. character was uh, Singaporean, 
and you know they're older like you know like that's you know takes place mostly in like asia i'm talking about like you know like 20 year old 21 year old asian american male and female like Mm -hmm. you know just just living their life in america you know like just every day in like like the backyards of uh schools and you know parking lots and houses in la like not one and you know like 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 attractive and like um but also a mess like you don't yeah. have one of them no, it's yeah. very rare like i know that netflix just had uh that teen series never have i ever um and this the the lead actress is a south asian um actress i think she's from canada actually is she from canada or american i forget um but like her love interest uh I'll be honest with you. Um, I had to, I was very shocked. I mean, the character's last name is uh, Yoshida, so uh-huh. he's like a mixed race. The 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 love her love interest or her crush is someone who's mixed race, but he's very white passing. Like when I watched the when we watched the uh, trailer, I didn't know that he was half Japanese. You know, what I mean? uh. so it was just sort of it was still like you'd have to really look and be like, okay, I, can, I think I can kind of see it. You know, so there's there's that whole thing. There's been that whole debate. There's been a lot of, you know, talk about the show. There's there's been praise. There's been some critiques. And, you know, the thing is, I don't really know too much about that specific culture, about Hindu culture. Um, so I leave that to the experts <laughs> to talk yeah. about the authenticity. But yeah, like as far as like the representation of like young Asian American culture, um, young Asian American couples is kind of like few and far between um Mm -hmm. but i I did want to talk about one of the storylines and that's why i definitely want you guys to be uh renewed for the third season as far as uh miggy's story arc um in one of the episodes in season two it was titled welcome to the hilltop we find out that we get kind of like a double whammy with uh miggy number one we find out that he is in a thruple (laughs) yeah. <laughs> so originally we knew he was dating uh the teacher uh the the second grade teacher um that's on the show and then we find out that miggy and his girlfriend have actually went on a uh dating app what was the a dating app called again i think it was bed bedmates or something like that and then <laughs> oh um, um uh uh, big bed was it big bed? big bed big bed yeah, yeah. yeah. so it yeah. was a big it was a dating app and so miggy and his girlfriend actually found another man to bring into the relationship yeah. and so that was fascinating to me because um you know number one usually when we see the representation of you know triads or thruples the default is usually a man and two women usually the two <laughs> yeah. women can be like queer or straight or whatever yeah. um and but like this kind of representation i was just like wait and they're all dating each other so it's not like miggy and the other guy or like have you know like everybody like we also find right. out that miggy is queer so how did that storyline come about like when they introduced it when they introduced that storyline to you like what what were your thoughts um, about that so um one day uh we were on set um at Fox and our showrunner JJ, she, you know, she was visiting us um, from the writer's room. And um, I think we had just finished like um, uh, a scene and we were, uh, you know, just kind of like chilling. And JJ was like, yo, Jake, uh, can I ask you a question? And mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, what's up? And she was like, so, you know, cause in season one, we talked about making, having um, Miggy, uh, uh be pansexual like that like is revealed oh. like he doesn't come out but it's revealed through dialogue right. um mm-hmm. and but we never uh, but i guess they didn't have the um like the the space like the like the 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 like a chance to do it so mm-hmm. season two like like early middle season two we're shooting season two she was like yo i want to i want to um do the pansexual you know storyline for miggy uh would you be okay with that and i was like yeah of course um, and she was like, all right, cool, cool. I just didn't want to, um, you know, uh, do like reveal something so like awesome and like, you know, so big about a character, you know, without having a group. And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Like, like, that's, that's great. Like it definitely like, you know, um, is, uh, something that like, I feel like it, it, it fits Miggy, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, but also like it adds like this great layer to Miggy, you know, um, as, as a person, and you know, like I'm pansexual in real life, so it's, you know, like it's, it's great. But mm-hmm. and then she was like, "Yo, like, yeah, we're thinking about like a thruple." 
and I'll like because he's poly, so like he's pansexual and he's polyamorous, and I was like, oh, that's wow. great. that's <laughs> amazing because I think there's there's at least one person in our writers' room mm-hmm. who's polyamorous. Oh, okay, yeah, that's I forget, great. I forget who it is. I think it's a woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't know who I don't know who it is exactly, but. I think so. She was like, yo, like he's polyamorous, but also like he's pansexual. Let's make him like, cause they were going to make him pansexual anyways. Like they were like hoping to. And so it's like, yeah, he's like in this, like he's like in this triad, you know, in this throuple. So, you know, when, and JJ asked me and I, and I approved, they were like, all right, cool, let's do it. And, 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 and then voila. That's amazing. But you know what? That actually makes sense now that you said that there actually some there is actually somebody who is polyamorous in the writer's room because even though this is a a family it's it's, it's a sitcom, I was really like I was so impressed with how like the sensitivity of that writing like it wasn't while it is a comedy show, they didn't play it for jokes. You know right. what I mean? Like this is right. like it was like this is make like this is and and also the representation of that that these were three very happy people. Like yeah. there wasn't, it wasn't like the lifetime thriller of the week where somebody goes crazy. Yeah, yeah, jealousy. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Right, because like, right. that's, that's kind of like what we've seen in like yeah. on movies and television. Like anytime there's like an approach to non-monogamy or polyamory, then yeah. it becomes like, so Oh, miserable. And they're yeah. so scornful. Yes. You know, it's usually like a couple, they want to, you know, put some spice into their relationship. And, you know, like there was this, um, this black movie that came out years ago called Twa, um, that kind of dealt with that, you know, kind of, it sort of went, it veered into fatal attraction. They, they picked up another woman and then she went crazy. She became very possessive of the husband and, you know, it was, it basically became a, like this thriller or whatever. And so that's kind of been like this pattern, like you've seen. It was was just like recently. There was a movie that came out recently where like this couple, they pick up this chick who like, they don't pick, they don't pick her up originally. Like she moves in because she's like the, the wife's friend. And then they, and then I forget the wife, she like ends up messing around with the girl, the friend, and then the wife asks the husband if, you know, he wants to join. And you know, like that's like, and it's a, but it's a thriller. So yes. like, you know, and I was like, all right, like all right, that's that's the one that you want to take. Like, and yeah, and and so it, what it does is that's why I noticed like when you try when you know when you I'm sure you have this experience that when you try to have a conversation about non monogamy or polyamory with people, I think that is part of the resistance right it's like yeah. this, this stigma is the stigma yeah, yeah, yeah. out of yeah. pop it's culture so where it's, yeah, yeah where usually like oh if women are like polyamorous they're weak you know they have no backbone they just let their man do whatever to them right. and like, yeah it's yeah, all right. these sort of things so i really appreciate it and there was one scene that i really liked um because in in the episode uh your girlfriend uh the character's name homily promsteller uh yeah. they they see her with another kissing another man on the street and right. so poppy um and and lee meester's character like they assume that she's cheating because they're like well that's miggy's girlfriend sure. and why she sure. why, yeah uh yeah. And, yeah and then why are we and then they go to the house <laughs> and then they see them you know at the window drinking wine they try to confront <laughs> them and then miggy comes out and he was like well yeah all three of us are together and then yeah, yeah, you guys yeah. kind of sit down and um, have this really cool conversation, and I, and and Poppy is like, well, how does that work? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted I just wanted to play a clip on that because I really loved what Homily said. I was like, yeah, somebody polyamorous is in that writer's room because yep. that yep. that was yep. Rogers. So I'll play the clip. Cool. I have a question. Sorry to sound like the old millennial, but how does this work? Anybody ever feel left out? Or we have a three pronged approach for working through the sticky stuff: radical honesty, active listening, and open communication. And it just works. Well, now I want to be in a thruple. I have a question. Sorry to sound that like was old. that was amazing. I love that. I was just like, "Yup, that is great." <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because you know, um, polyamory is not as easy as people think. I think that people think that like polyamory and non-monogamy is just like 
number one, it just it people assume that if you're polyamorous, that you will just sleep with anything, like that with anybody, right. and that you have right. no standards, right? Right, right, right? Um, so there's one that, and then number two, there's this idea that if you're polyamorous, that it, it you're you're greedy, like you're double dipping, triple dipping, quadruple right. dipping, and that yeah. there are no like guidelines, like like monogamy has more structure and that polyamory is it. So like in your personal experience, being a polyamorous person, what would you say to someone who may have these stereotypes or these, or these ideas about polyamory? Um, you know, a, a, every um, couple, every partner is different in what they, what they want and need. But I think also what's really important is that like, what people want and need change all the time. So I think that is something that like, if you understand that about yourself and other people, it would save a lot of like stress and fighting and grief, you know, you know, and I think communication saves a lot of that too. But it's like a lot of people tend to be like, okay, fine. Like these are the rules and this is set and like it's set in stone and like, okay, like this is what we're going to go, go forward with. And if someone like, you know, changes their, you know, like just kind of like feels like, okay, like th- this isn't what they wanted. Maybe they want something else and they bring it up. I feel like a lot of people will be like, no, but you said you wanted this, right? Or like, didn't you mm-hmm. say, you know, and I think, and sure that, that's, that applies to monogamous relationships too. But I think with polyamorous relationships, it's even more sensitive because you're including an, other people into the relationship. So I think that is something that people should be mindful of. Um, also, uh, yeah, like just communication is so key, obviously. Um, and like, it's not like, sure, there are people who use the term poly to like go out and just like, you know, um, sleep around. But mm-hmm. there are a lot of people who don't do that. There are a lot of people who, who it's, it's, it's deeper than that. It's not always about just like, sex it's it's physical it's emotional you know it could be mental like you know some people might actually like have a just want like an emotional connection that you know they might be lacking with some you know with their partner and that it just and they're just not the other partners just not capable of giving that kind of like supportive connection which is okay like not everyone can be everyone else's like you know um emotional support the way they want them to um and it's like nothing wrong with that. Like I have a friend um, and she has been with her her boyfriend for like over 10 years. And wow. I, remember, I remember her telling me this. I remember her telling me this recently, like maybe in the past few years. She was like, yo, so recently, you know, um, my boyfriend, uh, we had a talk where I told him, I was like, you know, uh, you you're you're very busy doing your work and i love you for that you take care of our you know of his um of of her son cuz he's like the stepdad uh and um you know but she she was like you know you know i have a high sex drive and um i just feel like i'm not being satisfied like sexually you know which is not your fault it's just you're you're busy working but you know like i i i'm i'm feeling frustrated you know she just she just was completely honest with him and he was like look i get it i don't want you to be unhappy um and, and mind you, they were monogamous before right. in, like, before this conversation. They were always monogamous. He's like, you know, if you can find someone to sexually satisfy you and, and if that will bring your happiness, I'm totally okay with that. Mm-hmm. And and she was like, really? He's like, yeah. And I, I know both of them personally. So right. hearing him, I knowing him, hear, when, when she told me he said that, I was, I was shocked. Because right. they're, you know... Uh, I just didn't think that he he thought that way, which mm-hmm. and so I was pleasantly surprised, and um, uh, and you know she felt like she was understood, and 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 that he cared because he was putting his her happiness before his pride, you know, right, um, and and I know my friend, she's not gonna just go like she was she was matter of fact she was telling me she's like yo like like when he said that you know, uh, we were both very happy. I made sure he, he meant it. He, he wasn't saying it, you know, like um, he was being forced to say it. He, he really didn't mean, mean it. And now my challenge is actually finding someone to like have sex with. Like that was, <laughs> she, right. she was 
yo, like I can't, you know, like I asked like maybe like one or two guys. Um, uh, but I think, I forget, I think they were like in a relationship and then she was like, I don't want to ask these other, other guys that I know because you know, like just, I have standards, you know, like, and, um, so, uh, I think she had just joined Tinder at the time that she was telling me a story and she was like, yo, it's hard. Like, it's hard to like meet up with these guys and just like do it. Like, you know, like. It, it, it's it's harder than I thought to just like have sex. So it's it's not always just like um like you just go around and just like have sex with someone just because you're you know you're you're longing for sex. You know like so it's it's a challenge. You know um, right. At least now, like they have reached a new level of like communication and 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 sort of like uh understanding their relationship. You know right. Yeah. Yeah. Because at what your what um. What her boyfriend uh, was expressing, um, I've been reading up on this, um, is what they call compersion, right? It's this this mm-hmm. this, uh, this empathetic state yeah. of wanting to see your partner happy, even if yeah. it's with somebody else, yeah. but just really, really having like this genuine and authentic joy, seeing them happy or derive happiness or pleasure yeah. with another person. Um, and that is hard. <laughs> like that it's takes a hard. lot of work um because you know yeah because you know I've, I've been in open relationships and I will honestly say that I feel that being in an open relationship or being in a non-monogamous relationship to me at least it's 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 it, it forced me to be more disciplined and it actually forced me to um strengthen like certain relationship skills that I felt that were a little slack as far mm-hmm. as being in a monogamous, we're not saying monogamous relationships, or I, I think both are equally valid. It's about what you bring into it. But I do right. think that with polyamory, it like it, you have to be honest. Like what um, Hamu yeah. said, it's like, it's about brutal honesty. Like if you're feeling dissatisfied or, you know, if something's bothering you or whatever, like you can't be passive aggressive in a, in a polyamorous relationship. It is not right. going to work. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. yeah like just really communication you know like Mm -hmm. it's i feel like that's like like number one like just brutal honesty communication just really because like no one can read minds out here you know like you gotta you gotta tell people like how you're feeling you know and and then move forward from there so Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. I, i mean i've seen conversations where you know, when it's like battle of the sexes. Right. And, you know, there will be women that will say like, well, he's supposed to know what I'm thinking. And I'm like, don't play this game because you're not going to win. Um, <laughs> no, it's exactly what you said. It's sort of like it's like they're they're giving this they're, they're giving men like these these tests that they can't possibly pass where it's yeah. like, well, like. I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to see if you can figure it out. And I'm like, you would save so much time if you just said what you meant and said what you felt like, honey, I really didn't like when you did. Or, you know, I feel like we should spend more time together or I feel neglected or, you know, whatever. And, and, yeah. what's, inter- and what's interesting is, um, you know, we're in the fourth season of Insecure. And our mutual Enjoy. friend Alexander Hodge, Asian Bay, yeah. um, <laughs> um, who plays Andrew, he's in this relationship, um, in an interracial relationship. And I love the fact that the problems that they have have nothing to do with their race. Um, so Molly and Andrew are right. kind of going through the past episode that we saw last Sunday. Um, there's sort of like a, a rift in their relationship because she's a lawyer. She's on the fast track at her uh-huh. law firm. And so she's having to spend more and more time Um, working on these, you know, briefs and these cases. And, you know, um, the Andrew character starts to feel neglected where he's just sort of like, I feel like we don't spend enough time with each other. And there's, you know, one scene where they finally met for dinner, um, you know, they're looking beautiful, having, you know, with the beautiful people. And, you know, she was like, oh, great. You know, she was like, well, after dinner, you know, we'll have dessert, wink, wink. And then he just... Uh gets quiet and he was like well i actually plan to meet up my boys after this to play poker or whatever uh-huh. and then she's like why would you plan something when we have a date night and he was like well i just thought you'd want to go back to work like that's been the pattern like we don't spend that mm-hmm. much time with each other and so it, it comes to a head where he just tells her i just feel like our our schedules are incompatible and she basically says you know, I guess she feels like she's about to lose him. So she, you know, plays a Hail Mary. She was like, well, I'm making you number one. And, you know, 
Um, I'm going to make you number one. You're my number one priority in my life. And I was just like, oh, this is going to end really badly. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're like this young, successful black woman. And, you know, I've worked at law firms and, you know, working as an associate, like they're you're working like 60, 70 hours a week. And, you know, when most people are going home, making dinner with their families, you're like just all the way in paperwork. And so mm-hmm. that demands that. And so I can kind of see there's there there's going to be a it's going to come to a head where there she's going to start resenting him where it's like, oh, yeah. OK, you know what I mean? And yeah. I was just I was just watching this episode and I'm like. There's an easy solution to this. Have an open relationship. Like, let this man go see other people, right? Because what it does is it it, it frees her up to devote the time she needs to her career. Yeah. And then it allows Andrew, and if she wants to see other people, that's fine. Um, and then it also allows Andrew, instead of those days or those nights where she's working late and she won't have to feel guilty because she's neglecting him, he can get his emotional or his sexual needs met with her and then the time that they have together uh-huh. is is theirs and that and you know that way she won't feel guilty she won't he won't feel resentful they will actually enjoy the time that they have with each other well you know of course i suggested that and people were like uh <laughs> it was like yeah. crickets in the room they're like why would you suggest something like that and i'm like all right <laughs> well i think people are still too like you said earlier it's stig- it's stigma it's taboo and people are still um too used to too comfortable with this traditional idea of just one person to another person mm-hmm. you know like um it it upsets the <laughs> like the common culture you know like it upsets it it forces people to what you said force them Mm-hmm. The reason why they kind of want to shut you down is because it forces them to like think outside of like what they're used to, like like their quote unquote norm, and right. it made them uncomfortable. Um, I think they're still. I, I wonder if it's you know still like a lot of his jealousy and 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 um like uh is a feeling of you own the other person, you own your partner. It's like the property, like you can't share. You know, yes, the That's, ownership, mm-hmm. the ownership. You know, and you know obviously not all monogamous relationships are like this but i feel like the people that react in a negative way to polyamory mm-hmm. kind of have that um, mentality where yeah the other person their happiness is their true their happiness is not the first priority it's mm-hmm. their their own happiness is like their own like comfortability like uh their ownership is not being uh threatened you know right yeah, because um, because if, if if that's not the case, then why would you feel so uncomfortable by someone uh, uh, promoting polyamory or talking about polyamory or um, like suggesting it? You know, yeah. they're not you know they're not preaching or shoving it down your throat. They're just suggesting it as an option. And if you feel threatened by it, then you know uh, there's something going like it's not it's not like a the 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 idea of monogamy in your head is not something that's about the other person's happiness. It's not, it's not compersion, you know? Yes. Right. And it, you know, it was interesting. I remember this was, I think this was a month and a half ago. There was an actress. She's a voiceover actress. And she said something to the effect, if I remember correctly, she said, she tweeted this. She was like, I would much rather that my boyfriend or that my partner cheated on me than to be in an open relationship. And I was like, for real, what? that's how the you feel. Like, Listen, listen. Crazy. I was like, and she didn't know because she thought she was saying something profound. She tweeted it. I feel like it was like on a Sunday morning. Yeah, like she was like, I'd rather that he cheated on me, but I didn't know about it. But I'd rather that than be in an open relationship. Yeah, open relationship. Yeah. And I guess she didn't know that non monogamy Twitter (laughs) was up and running. Twitter. Yo, send me that. (laughs) Text me. Text me that tweet. Oh, I will. Yo, they dragged her. She was like, wait, what? Hold up. What just happened here? And, but I mean, I, I, let me be clear. When I say drag, I, I'm joking. But I mean, what happened was like you had people in the polyamory and the non monogamy community that I felt were um, respectfully 
um, you know, debating her on this on this yeah. issue. They were like, well, this is this is what non-monogamy is, and this is what polyamory is, and then you know what I mean. Like they were very respectful to her, and they were, but they were pushing back. Like they were like, you're not gonna re- disrespect our community. You know what I yeah, mean? Because yeah, yeah. yeah, so she was kind of like she. I, you kind of saw her sort of like <laughs> walking back a little bit. <laughs> You know yeah. what I mean? And um, again, you know, the polyamory community was just like, listen, again, we have nothing against monogamy. That's, you know, again, it's a valid choice if that's what you want to do. But, you know, what you're not going to do is come on Twitter and disrespect us, you know, and play in our face oh. like that. And I was like, oh, wow. I loved it. I have to be honest with you. I really enjoyed watching that because, you know, I kind of feel like I, I kind of jokingly say that, like, I feel like the maybe one of the final frontiers of civil rights, right? Like we had, you know, the fights for black people and people of color. And then we had, you know, the fight for disabled people and also, you know, um, for queer people. I kind of feel like that's probably going to be one of the new fights um, because there are a lot of people living, and I say this in air quote, non-traditional relationships. If people would be shocked, shocked. I'll show you a happy monogamous looking couple and I'll tell you what they've got on their calendar. You'd be shocked. (laughs) Oh, what they have. Yeah. So it's just sort of like, so I kind of feel like that's going to be like the new thing where people will fight for the rights for three people to be married. You know what I mean? Or if, or if it's a, a, what is it? A quadrangle, right? Yeah. Or four people where it'll just be like, Uh cause right now, yeah, cause the state, it has to be between one man or woman, or it has to be two parties. And now it's going to be like, no, we want to, and and I don't think it's because I think some people get polyamory and polygamy mixed up a little bit. Like right, there's, right. there's there's some it's crossover, different. but it's different, right? Yeah, yeah. Different. you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah. And so it's like yeah. like what your what your what Mickey's situation in single parents that's not polygamy. Like at least I don't think so. That's yeah, polygamy. polygamy is marriage of um I think mm-hmm. it's it's is marriage of multiple people. Yeah, um, yeah. And then polyamory is not marriage, but you know it's um just multiple people. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I can understand why some women would be, you know, they, they kind of have that idea of like the sister wives, you know, like the guy with like 12 wives and like 55 kids. Oh and, my you know, God. <laughs> that's, that's like extreme. It's like very rare. It's like very extreme. Yeah. Like, and also a valid choice if that's what you want. Yeah, but I'm just saying yeah. like, yeah, but, yeah. um, but I did want to ask you, cause I know when we met, ooh, what was that? Like 2016, I feel like we met. Um, and then I think it was like a couple of years ago. That's when you came out as queer and mm-hmm. pansexual. Like what was the process? Like what made you decide to come out or to declare your, your sexuality were like, what were the conversations that you had? And then with your, you know, like your manager, like with your team, like, was, was it more like, no, it'll destroy your career. And, you know, nah, what was the conversation no, with your family? No, nah, it wasn't. There was none, no, no conversations like that. It, Cause oh. it wasn't like, it wasn't planned. It wasn't like I, I, I planned to do that. It, it, cause, cause to me, it wasn't like, I was like, okay, like I'm going to say this during this interview. And then, like um this is like uh gonna affect my career like like it was literally i was just doing i was being interviewed by my friend david at very good light um um and uh we were just talking about everything we're talking about like single parents like the acting career like masculinity like you know asian representation like the art of like acting like the craft of acting um and david him he's he's a, a gay asian american man and so he was like so we're talking about that. Like, I think he, he asked, or we were talking about sexuality. And then I was like, yeah, I'm fluid. Um, wow. Like, oh, okay, cool. Like, yeah, like, you know, what does that mean to you? And I was like, oh, this, like, this then, the third. And then, and then we went on to the next question. Like, it wasn't like, like, I checked in with, like, my reps or anything like that. Um, mm-hmm. or, like, like my, my reps and ABC Fox Publicity knew that I was doing the interview. Mm-hmm. But... It was just like it like I, I didn't even think of like in like the morning before like the morning of like before the interview I didn't even like think I was gonna say it it I just it just came out and wow. then yeah and then everyone you know took it and ran with it like and then, so I was like yeah that's what I said <laughs> you know, like, I said it <laughs> I said what I said you know like in the wise words of um 
uh, who is that? Is that um uh, Nene uh, Nene, uh Leaks? Yes, Nene, Nene Leaks. I said Nene, what I said. I said what I said. <laughs> you know, um, but it was yeah, it was it was just a part of the interview, and then, and then we moved to the next question, and then mm-hmm. and then um he came out with the uh, the article, and uh, you know the title was like Jake Choi is like the sexually fluid like leading actor that hollywood needs or something, something like that so you know like it was in the, it, it was in the headline and everything like that yeah. and so like a lot of these like bigger uh lgbtq um publications and media outlets like they they were like sharing it um and you know the community was so open and you know like uh welcoming yeah and, I, I saw yeah. your speech what was that that was for the hrc right yeah that was the hrc um gala in um uh i, I believe Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Wow, that was a yeah, beautiful I speech. Huh? I was, I was, I, that was a beautiful speech. I was watching Thank it you. during lunch, and I was crying. People were like, "What's wrong with you?" I'm like, "I'm oh, good." These are these no. are tears of these are tears of happiness. There's not. <laughs> I was just like, I was just like, look at my friend. Like he's just standing in his truth and looking fabulous, by the way. And I was just like, "Wow, we're we're in a new age." You know what I mean? Like where you can have. Yeah. You could be like an Asian American actor and be like, yes, I'm, I'm sexually fluid. And yes, and I can play all sorts of roles. Like, yeah. I mean, ever, ever since that's come out, have you felt that the type of roles that have been coming your way have been impacted by that? Or it doesn't or it doesn't matter that you don't you no. haven't seen a difference. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know if it's been if it has been impacted, like to, to me in terms of like patterns, it hasn't been like mm-hmm. nothing. It seems different to me um uh you know and that's what i'm hoping um right you know i you know I, for all i know maybe there are some people <clears throat> some you know casting people executives that are like you know this this role is straight he's leading man he gets a girl man, we shouldn't audition jake Choi. i mean mm-hmm. you know who knows like uh i'm i'm hoping that's not the case mm-hmm. uh i've i've after that speech just came out like i've you know read four roles that are like you know, straight, gay, you know, queer, uh, you know, everything in between. Um, So it hasn't really been impacted, you know, which is, which is great, you know, because this was 10, 20 years ago, it would, I would, I wouldn't be saying this probably, you know. I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, cause you played, I mean, you played a, a queer um, lead character in front cover. Love that movie. Um, And then also in, in, in succession. Um, So I, you know, yeah, but I mean, do you feel that at least in it, it, like you have your sexuality, right? But as far as like your presentation it, it leans towards more what they would say masculine, right? Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel that for queer actors, at least if you have more of a more masculine presenting um, energy about you, that it's a little bit easier than say if you're queer and not in that by not in that binary of like female and masculine is it do you notice that there's a little bit of maybe more resistance if you're queer and maybe not you know coming off as like alpha male or with like a six pack or whatever um probably Mm -hmm. yeah probably because i think still you know, uh, in the industry, it's very, it's still mostly like straight male ran, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and no matter how progressive, like the industry wants to say they are, like, pe- they're still putting people in boxes. And so if you, let's say you're a gay actor, let's say you're a gay Asian actor, and um, you come off you know, in your everyday life as androgynous or more feminine, you know, like they're going to probably see that and be like, you can only play these roles. Mm. Even though you're an actor and, you know, your job is to act and be a chameleon and, you know, um, uh, uh, portray roles, different kinds of characters, human beings, they're going to be like, no, like this is your energy. This is your image. So like you're going to you you know it doesn't matter how good of talented of an actor you are you're just gonna play these roles, right? And, um, you know hopefully that changes. Uh, I think it's changing little by little, but 
you know, like look at um who's the 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 very famous gay actor um that was on Suits, uh, Matt Bomer, right? Yes, Matt Bomer. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. He's gay. He's gay. Mm-hmm. He's and he came out like he's been he's been out right, but right. like you know, and but I didn't know he was gay until someone told me like because because ah. you know, like his his he comes off as very like you know like leading man kind of like this like I, I you know I'm not gonna say alpha male because I don't know him like that but like right. his roles are very like you know masculine and there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that like that's mm-hmm. him that's his prerogative but like if you if if he wasn't like that like would he be playing these roles you know still you know like I don't know that's some that's that's a question that I gotta ask yeah well I remember Billy Porter um who's uh he's an openly gay black actor from Pose Love and Billy he was- Porter. Yeah, and he was in the Hollywood, um, the Hollywood Reporter Roundtable, the Actors Roundtable, and I, I loved what he said. Like he was just like when he, he was like, I had all these accolades from Broadway. I'm like this Tony winner, this great actor, beautiful voice. You know what I mean? And then he comes to Hollywood, and he was like, he just hit a dead end. He was like, it was like audition after audition after audition, and they were. It basically came down to you're not butch enough to play like these male lead roles and he was like but i'm an actor like i can you know what i mean i can i can do whatever and so he was like it really wasn't until pose right a show that was like co-created by uh you know afro latino queer man and um steven canals shout out steven um yeah i love steven and he was like that's where i found my home but he was like that's what we're coming up against is like even like our our sex, our gender expression is still held against us. Like if yeah. we don't meet these standards of, you know, masculinity. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting to me to kind of see like the double standards there, but um, yeah. 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 So, um, so we're, so we're waiting for, th- for the um, announcement for third season of, of single parents. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So what is going to be like the first thing you do once you get out of quarantine? Where's like the first thing you want to do or like where you want to eat? Where do you want to go? God, I, I, I'm thinking the beach. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking the beach. Um, and I miss going to a cafe and just like reading a book or having coffee with a friend. Mm-hmm. So those two things. Yeah. Beach and cafe. Yeah. So how is like that's a question that I've been uh, that I'm very curious about. It's like how has the pandemic affected single dating life? Like, are you talking to people, or is it just sort of like I'll just wait until the quarantine's over and then we can meet up, or is it just like I'll just wait until it's over before I even? Yeah, I ain't got no choice. <laughs> you know, like like if I was. If I was, you know, seeing someone before the pandemic and before mm-hmm. shutdown, and we were seeing each other like consistently throughout, and we knew that like we were not seeing anyone else, obviously, or quarantining, you know, that's different. But like, I'm not gonna meet anyone now, right? In the middle of it, mm-hmm. um, you know. I mean, shit. Like, you gotta be like freaking like Rihanna. If you're, you know what? If you're Rihanna. <laughs> You might risk it all for Rihanna. <laughs> risk it all. I will. I I will risk it all. I will. I will get a fucking ventilator made for me. Like I will risk it all for Rihanna. Like, I look. You call me careless. You can call me the, any name. Yo, I'll take it. You can. You can. Someone can drag me. If it's Rihanna, I will meet her right now. Right. Oh, let's let's be real. I mean, listen. People are being politically correct on social media. I'm sure there are people that are meeting on the down low, breaking quarantine. Of course I, they are. They're, they're not. Yeah. They're not going to out themselves. But I'm sure that. I mean, we're going. Like, I went into quarantine. Like, my last day of work declared work quarantine like March seventh. So that was oh. like my last day of work and my last day that I was in Manhattan. I've been in my room except to go shopping since March eighth. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine for people who've been in quarantine that long, people yeah. have needs, you know what I'm saying? So I was just yes. like, yes, mm. we do. yeah. So I was like, I'm not, I'm not, you don't have to out yourselves, but you know, and now the weather's getting warmer, especially here on the East coast. So I, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, thank you so much, Jake. Thank you for finally being on the show. I'm so happy we did this. Thank you for having me on. You're for welcome. Real. Yes, I'll be in LA. Once, hopefully, once this whole thing finishes off, I 
promised myself that I was going to go to LA in yeah. 2020 or whenever it's safe to fly again. So we yeah. will definitely hang out and, yeah. you know, do our thing and hang out and stuff. So I can't wait. It's nice right. out here right now. It is. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Everyone, thank you for listening to a new episode of the Spectrum Lounge. Catch you on the other side. Bye.